and you'll also you'll also get a copy of this recording. Close this one. Okay, great. Okay, this is uh, our Live from the Alps uh, 2023 Break the Trail Part 2 uh, webinar that we're doing. And I'm coming to you today from Zamat. And those who joined a little bit earlier, I was trying to get out of the shot. So you can see there. I've been here three days, four days now, and this is the first time it's been like this. It's been covered over in uh, cloud uh, the rest of the time, or some part of it has been. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to see it. I've been staring up at it all day. And uh, it's a fitting end location to uh, the journey that I've had over the last few weeks. It feels very satisfying to be sitting here um, in Zermatt, especially last night when there was a, a hell of a storm that came through um, at about 4 p.m. And I was glad to be have finished and be and be sitting here in my apartment. Um, let's start here. Oh, hang on. Ah, this one. Okay, sorry. All right, today's agenda. So we're going to start off with a little bit of, about us, about who I am, about what the hiking club is, um, about what Break the Trail is, for those of you who don't know. Um, then I'm going to cover uh, a section I'm calling What's the Go with the Snow? Um, so is this year normal for those who don't follow the snow situation in the Alps? How quickly is it melting? What's it like at the high elevations? Um, and when will it be gone? I'll look into my crystal ball and give you a get. Uh, then I'm going to talk about early season trail challenges. So these are long journeys that you're all embarking on. Um, and therefore, I thought it would be best to address sort of five of the key challenges for early season hiking in the Alps in, in, on these trails um, and then identify what kind of gear can help you and then talk a little bit about the type of people that um, do well or have safe journeys um, in the early season um, in the Alps as well. And then the last section I'm going to cover is current hotspots on each of the trails that we support, so the Tour de Mont Blanc, the Walker's Hat route, and only a little bit of the Tour of Monterosa, I'm sorry, but um, I've got some things to share on that about where we can get some more updates in the coming weeks. In terms of for questions, uh, you can put them in the, the question box um, and we'll pick them up at the end. So you can put them in throughout the presentation. I don't think I'll be able to see them as I go, but at the end I'll um, I'll refer to them. I've got a few that came through on Instagram as well that I'll start with. Um, I'm sure there'll be time. Last time it took about 40 minutes to get through the material and then 20 minutes for questions. If I don't answer any though, I'll, I'll pick them up and I'll, I'll do something on Instagram um, this coming week. So who am I? Um, I'm Brendan Jones. I'm the founder of The Hiking Club. Um, I've been exploring the outdoors since I was a kid and I just love the way that hiking makes me feel. Uh, my first legendary trail in the Alps was actually the Walker's Hout route in 2017 and I found it hard to plan. I didn't want to do the standard plan. I wanted to do something, wanted to compress it into a few less days and do something a bit different and it was hard to do. So my mastery is using my accounting and technology background to organise trail data in a way that I can help people do short fast plans or long luxurious plans, all different and everything in between. Um, since 2017, I've mapped all the high route hiking trails in the Pennine Alps between and around Mont Blanc and the Monte Rosa Massif. Um, I spent each summer in the Alps to be one of the first on the trails. Um, and I love also to explore new routes as well. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is sort of the fifth year that we've been doing this and still loving it. About the hiking club, so we help self-guided hikers to confidently plan and prepare for their legendary trails in the Alps. So this year we have over 150 groups that are supported by the Hiking Club and we support them in a few different ways. So we have an itinerary builder product for people to create a personalised plan. We have a custom GPS map um, that they use to navigate the trail with their, their mobile. 
we have training programs, we have workshops, and also I do consult for those who have some specific needs. Um, if you'd like a consult or a GPS map for your Tour de Mont Blanc, Walker's Hat route, or Tour de Mont Rossa, um, we can create one in line with what the itinerary is that you put together, um, and uh, you can use that to then guide you on your way. What is break the trail? So knowing what the early season trail conditions are like is a really important part of a self-guided hiker's journey. Um, it helps with awareness of the challenges, uh, appropriate gear choice, uh, a review of alternate routes and options, and then if necessary, a revision of plan. Um, so we did our first break the trail hike in 2019. And then with the support of the hiking community, we've documented the first detailed record of uh, the, what the conditions are like on these legendary trails each year since. So, what's the go with the snow? Are these conditions normal? Well, looking at the last sort of five years that I've been following it closely, this year seems pretty average, pretty pretty much in the middle. It's not spectacularly low, it's not spectacularly high, it's, um, it's an average year. So, if we compare it over just the last three years, um, there's about half the amount of snow this year compared to 2021, which was an especially um, big year for snow um, in the early season hiking. And then there's about double what the snow was last year. Um, and yet last year was considered an, an exceptional year. Um, at the end of May, the conditions were more like the end of June, what the end of June would normally be. So yeah, we're in, we're in average year. <clears throat> and how quickly is it melting? So if we just look, um, this is the last records that um, they did the Avalanche Bulletin for, which has this great picture, which probably many of you have seen before, that they update on a daily or by daily basis. Um, but the snow was melting at about a foot a week. Um, and the snow line was rising at around 100 metres a week um, on, the, on the south facing side, a little bit less on the north facing side. And what I'm seeing being up there in the sort of high mountain area, so I'm, I'm seeing these snow caps are also, sorry, snow cups are also forming um, on the remaining snow patches. So we're seeing a more rapid or more acceler accelerated rate of that melt as well. So a foot a week roughly at the beginning of June, and I'd say it's it's above that now. Um, up, I've been up as high as over just over 2,900 metres now and you're still getting the snow patching out you're not having that it's not a clear snow line anymore um a lot of the terrain is exposed and you just sort of it's you know different sizes of snow patches um on each of the trails in that higher sections rather than like where is a defined snow line these are just some pictures of some of the areas so um these are all on the walkers hat route so the round cabin Pufluri, cultasart medici on the alternate route, on the Walker's Hout route, um, you're seeing those those snow cups appear. And how quickly is it melting at the moment? So I like to look at the freezing line to help um, determine sort of what, what, what pattern we're in, whether we're in a melt pattern or whether we're in when it's holding stable. And as expected, now we're in sort of the late part of June. Um, we're seeing the freezing level sitting well above the trails that we're hiking on. So the Tour de Mont Blanc highest points on the main trail are just over two and a half thousand metres. And we're seeing the freezing line up over 4,000 metres in this coming six days. When I've been looking in the last weeks as well, it's been sitting above 3,000 metres. Um, the Walker's Hout route is just under 3,000 metres for their highest points. And then the, the Tour de Monte Rossa is, with the exception of the Fetal Pass being, being over that and glaciated anyway. So that will hold snow for uh, for the season there. So what we're looking at in the next six days, and this has been sort of the trend, is that the freezing level continues to rise. Um, the temperatures at this is at two and a half thousand meters are sitting over ten degrees Celsius or fifty Fahrenheit, and we're starting to see a lot more sunshine. And we're right in the summer solstice now, so we're getting these really long days as well. So yeah, the good news is the melt is certainly on and it's accelerating. Now, what's it like at the, the higher elevations? So 
this is a this is from the Avalanche Service of Switzerland that some of you may have seen as well, um, which I, I like to watch how this changes, this snow map changes. Um, and, it, and it's a bit of a kind of heat map around what the depth is like at different points. And I took a screenshot of an area that has the, the Swiss section of the Tour de Mont Blanc, the Walker's Hat route being the primary bit, and then the, the Tour de Mont Rosa as well. So if we look over on the bottom left-hand corner, we've got the uh, Tour de Mont Blanc. We've got Grand Col Ferret there, just over 2,500 metres. And it's saying that there's a 5 to 20 centimetre um, no depth at that point. Um, Walker's Hat route then, you're looking at the Grand Desert, so that high alpine plateau and you've got up to 120 centimetres still in that area, in that main um, ridge that runs down the middle of it. Um, that's where it's sort of at the 120, and then at other parts around there, you, you lower down, you, you're, around, you're around 50 centimetres, but still a lot of snow in the Grand Desert. If you look at the passes then, Col de Sart, they're saying 20 to 50 centimetres, you know, being up there a few days ago, um, there's definitely like a main patch at the top with each of them, but the trail does a pretty good job at avoiding it. So you've got to cross it a couple of times, but it's not like you're in that for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of metres or, or feet as you ascend or descend. Um, then on the, the Tour of Monte Rosa, so Paso Monte Moro, which is uh, one of the challenging passes on the Swiss side. It holds snow for the longest time. It's got a lot of... Um, no melt runoff that comes down this rocky face as well so it's one to watch to see when it's good to cross um, they're reporting at the moment 50 to 80 centimeters still on that part so that would be quite challenging at the moment and then Theodore Pass being up over 3,000 meters glaciated as well they're reporting 120 to 200 centimeters but you'd expect it to hold snow through the entire season. So the message at the higher elevations is that there's a little bit more, but if we're talking under the 3,000 metres, then we're looking at a lot more patchy snow rather than that defined snow line. So when will the trails be snow free? This is a million dollar question. Uh, so last time I did this uh, presentation at the start of June, I said the Tour de Mont Blanc could be July 10th. I'm going to pull it back three days. Just from what I'm seeing in the rapid um, melt that's on. So conservatively still probably, but July 7th, I think will be the day that people will be able to start that tour and on the main trail and uh, and not step in snow. So July 7th, Tour Mont Blanc, Walker's Hout route, excluding the Chilean Glacier, which will hold snow through the season, or, or it'll be ice, but um, hold some snow a little bit longer. Uh, July 25th, and then Tour of Monte Rosa, excluding Theodore Pass, I'm guessing July 20th. So if you're hiking around these times, send me a message if you're able to complete the trail without stepping in snow, because I'd love to uh, mark that down and, and use that in future years. That's what I've got for a guess for you. All right, early season trail challenges. Now, like I said, I thought it would be the best thing to do is to highlight five trail challenges that you have in the early season um, when you're going on these hiking journeys that you don't necessarily have later on once the snow's melted. Um, and identify some tips that you can use if you're about to hit the trail yourself um, and try and give you, yeah, um, it's, not, it's not trying to scare you at all. It's, it's just trying to... Um, explain the challenge if you're not aware of, of what the alpine conditions are like while there's still snow around for hiking. So the first one is post tolling, right? So it seems pretty harmless, um, but it can be incredibly energy sapping. Um, and it can also slow you down significantly as well. Like if you get a deep pocket of snow that you're crossing, you can almost swim through it at times and what would normally take you minutes, could take you 30 minutes. Um, so it's, there's a time factor there as well. Then you've got hidden hazards, which um, some of them could be expected. So if you've got snow over a boulder field, then you know that um, post holing in that area, you're likely to fall through, you could cut, you could sprain, God forbid you could break something. But so there's sort of, 
things you can identify in terms of those potential hazards with post hauling and then there's other parts where if you see that gift that i've got just there so i'm just rolling up at like an, a high alpine meadow at that point that's still covered in snow and i'm just falling down onto the the grass so there may be a rock or two under there i, I could get a scratch or something but it's it's not the same I, and um it's a bit different so two different things so some tips probing with poles to try and identify where the really soft pockets are and where the firm pockets are. Um, step in other people's prints. So even if there's like a footprint that's down a foot, I'd normally step into that because I know that's been compressed down. Um, and it's also a warning sign if someone, if I see a hole that's like, you know, to the hip, then I'll back up and I might go, I might use the sticks and, you know, find a, a firmer piece to go around because I know it's a really soft pocket. Take a big stride when you're coming on and off exposed to rain so it's not necessarily to jump because you can obviously that was more of an impact into the snow but um it's usually most it's usually softest and most treacherous when you're getting on and off the rocks um and then try your best to avoid the deep pockets of snow so you know you might have a bit of energy and you might be like i'll just ford through this snow but you don't know how long that's going to go for and it could really drain you of energy so do think about going around rather than just pushing through. Um, and even when you're using like a GPS map to navigate as well, you don't necessarily need to go right on that line. You can just go to either side of it if you can find a, a ridge of exposed terrain or something that, that looks safe rather than just wading across a big snow pocket there as well. All right, the next one is snow bridges. So it can be as harmless as getting wet feet or it can be as serious as being swept away. Um, so tips for these are to probe with the poles again to try and assess the weakness of it. Um, and, and you're also looking and listening for signs of weakness too. So you can, you can visibly see cracks. You can see where other people might have stepped through. Sometimes you can get back and you can look under it and see how thick that layer looks like it is um, consider other ways to cross so don't always just mindlessly follow the footprints that go across the snow in the same section a lot of the time it'd be better to you know be a meter above it or something and and and, um, and go around or to cross a different way um, it could be where the snow is melted off the trail it, look, it might be a safe way to go so you need to make that assessment when you're there and then the last one is to weigh up the consequences with these because they can be pretty, they can be very serious. And so if there is genuinely no place that you can cross, you're looking at your map and, and where you need to backtrack to to go around it. Um, so yeah, snow bridges. Steep snow. So steep snow is also very energy sapping. Um, and this is when they it can be hard so when it's hard you like cutting your foot in so that's like three kicks four kicks five kicks to get a really firm hold um or it could be soft stop that soft snow which then you're kind of falling into it's almost like that post holing thing you can have a, this slow slide down the mountain and you just cannot sort of get out of it you just kind of you're stuck in it you can't find anything firm to like pat down and, and climb out if you've, you know if you snowboard or skied on powder days and you've had stacks where there have been like huge dumps of snow and you kind of know what i mean in this in this respect the snow gets like that um in the alpine when it's, when it's melting um so steep snow yeah it's not just the slip risk sort of the rapid slip risk and fall off the mountain it's also the wading in it and you can't you can't get out of it and the La Chaminade, the um, rescue service out of Chamonix, have said there's been a lot more rescues in the soft snow up around La Brevent than there has been with anyone falling, like, because it's just not firm enough to fall sort of fast and, and down. Um, so some tips. So this one, you're absolutely weighing up the consequences um, before you're crossing. Take your time to evaluate. So, you know, one foot at a time, you're always having a, the three points of contact. Um, continue to reevaluate. So looks good, you make a start, two steps in, you don't like it, that's absolutely fine. That's the right, that's the right assessment you should be doing, right reevaluation you should be doing. And then don't believe that it gets better. This is a bit of a trap that, you know, hiking people are generally pretty optimistic people. They're out there filling up their cup and 
quite positive. But in this respect, you, you shouldn't look at it to think that, you know, it's it's going to get better up here. I'll just keep pushing on, I'll keep pushing on because you can, you can get yourself into no man's land in the middle of something that you don't want to be in. The next one is snowmelt triggered rock fall. Um, so this is just simply dangerous. Um, you don't you don't see much or you don't see any of it really on the on the tour de mont block i can't think of any section that it's um that it's a serious risk there but on the walkers hat route you do um on the tour de monterosa as well so some tips for this so you're looking above the trail so you're not just sort of following your balcony you're looking up to see um you're looking at for evidence of past rock falls in the area um you're looking for snow above you um don't wear headphones if um, you're passing in these sections and then and then ultimately it's if it does look too bad then you're avoiding it so that picture i've got there is just the, the starting section of the sentia de chamois trail um, just past cabin de montfort so you cross over onto that face and you traverse that face every year there's rock falls on that face as the snow melts there's evidence of it um, you ask the tourism officers they'll say don't do it until july um, and so this is a great example of, of where if you get to that area, you look at it, you see, and you're like, I don't like the look of that at all. Then, you know, you're pulling out your map, you're looking at what your other options are um, to get around it. And there are, there are some to get around this part. It's not all, it's not the whole Hout route. Absolutely not. It's just in specific sections that you be aware of, of it. Then the last one is snow melt charged streams. Um, so this is where there's an, an increased water flow um, and rapid changes in the water level as well. So some tips here is, you know, you're limiting your time crossing water. Um, it might seem obvious, but, you know, sometimes people get there and have a break and want to pull up their water, do whatever. Um, but you get through those areas quickly, weighing up the consequences. So if you are going to do something, if you are going to kind of fall across it, um, then really have a look at if you do fall and slip, like how far down would you go? Um, identify if there's a safe alternate way to cross nearby as well. So the route that's normally taken during these sort of the early part of the season with the higher water flow, there might be a better place and a safer place to cross. So, so make that assessment as well when you're there. So what, what gear helps you? So hiking poles, probably obvious, but they, they help incredibly with balance, but also with that probing of snow. So, you know, everything from the, the post holing to the snow bridges, you're using that pole to, to determine whether you're confident putting your own foot on, on that or in that. Um, micro spikes then provide you with the extra grip and traction. And they also provide you with confident footing. So anyone who's hiked in the high alpine and knows what it's like to go in the snow in early season conditions, you can make your own assessment as to whether you think you need micro spikes or not. Like the snow is generally soft at the moment, but even, even that said, you're still gonna find little pockets of firm stuff. Now, if you don't know what it's like hiking in the snow, um, and this will be you know, your first time, you potentially have some that you're gonna cross, and you're also a little bit unsure about how you know you're going to feel when you're like trying to traverse a little bit or go down a little bit um, of it then it can give you incredible confidence to wear as well as give you a little bit of extra traction and grip on there too and then the other the other time i'd consider it is if you if you've got a relatively old pair of boots or trail runners that you're planning to use you didn't want to switch them over because they're broken in and you know you run out of time or whatever have the spikes as well to um to give you that extra grip if you're going to need it because i've previously in, in at times i've tried to cut in with very limited grip on my trail runner and it's bloody hard and it feels very slippery um so at that point i'd have a yeah a micro spike but it's always better to have a obviously a boot with grip too or a shoe with grip on it too last one is what about an ice axe so a lot of people ask you know whether they should bring an ice axe for this I would say if, if you're someone who's hiked in the in the alpine early season and you've got one and you know what you're doing with it then again you can you can make that determination um it will be helpful at times 
on specific trails, if you stay at Cabin de Moray, they would more often have a night that would drop below zero while there's snow still there. It's going to help you get down more confidently. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring an ice axe or buy an ice axe for the first time just for this trip. Um, if there's something that you know requires one, then then it would be the advice would be to to avoid that. But you know, a lot of the time with micro spikes, poles, and going very slow, you can still cross terrain. And and you know, I've got an example from a couple of years ago when it was that big snow year. There was even another dump of snow at the start of July at Cabin de Moray. It was freezing, and there was a big group of people that had to descend down. None of them had their ice axes. They took it slow. They had their micro spikes, they had their poles, and they all got down safely. Um, so, yeah, ice axe I generally say no to. I carried mine all over um, the trail this time. I used it at La Brevent on the Tour de Mont Blanc in the first week of June um, when I was breaking the trail there. And then I used it coming down from Moray last week because I was with another group that had just summited one of the back peaks and all had their mountaineering gear and they pulled theirs out and I had mine and I, you know, I didn't want to be the one to skittle them as they were coming down. So, um, but otherwise, I, I don't think I really needed it and, and I didn't use it at any other point. So that's that's my uh, thoughts on the ice axe. Is early season hiking for everyone now? For those of you who are already booked and, uh, you know, coming anyway, you know, I don't want to say anything to, to make you reconsider your trip. But uh, I will just call out a few things that um, I'd say are common with people hiking safely in the early season. So they're typically experienced in, in the early season conditions. So they're kind of aware of these things that I'm talking about won't be new. It'll just be like, okay, that's where the season's at in the Alps at the moment. Um, they're experienced at risk assessing and reevaluating. So they can, you know, look at terrain, look at the environment and sort of understand what's happening in that area. Um, they're well prepared. So They've got the appropriate gear, um, you know, they carry extra snacks and things because they know that they're going to go slow. Um, they know what services are available because early season, a lot of the little huts and restaurants aren't necessarily open. Um, and they've got a knowledge of the area. It doesn't mean they've been to the area. It just means that they've they've properly understood what they're going into in terms of terrain and um, transport networks and all of that sort of thing. They're fit and strong. Like, you, you have to be early season because you, you know, you slow down a lot, you're using a lot more energy in any kind of snow crossing um, and you've got the right mindset. So you're flexible with your plans, um, you know your limits and you know how you perform as well. So, you know, you've had taken a long time to do that section more than double what you planned. Can you do the next section as planned? No, I know where I'm at right now. I, um, I can't do that. I need to change my plan. So those are the things. So I hope uh, you know anyone hiking in the next week sort of has 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 these sort of qualities or or things about them that that will help them with their journey. Um, and if you don't, then you know think about them. And and I and I think some of these ones you can yeah understand where I'm coming from. All right. So current hotspots by trail. This is probably a section that uh, many of you may be interested in. I'm going to kick it off with the. The Tour de Mont Blanc. So, um, the first one to call out is between Col de Brevent and Le Brevent. So, this is just behind Chamonix. So, from Chamonix in the valley, you can get a gondola up to Plan Pra in the ski area, which is where the Tour de Mont Blanc trail goes. It doesn't go through Chamonix itself, it goes up above there. And then from Plan Pra, you go up higher to Col de Brevent and then Le Brevent, the top of the, the mountain there. Um, and between the coal and the top on that back side, you've got some steep terrain. And it's also a, a north facing slope and it's still got a lot of snow on it. There's a section over there with ladders, which sort of highlight, you know, the, the steep ascent that you, um, or descent that you, that you need to do in that area. So steep snow is a challenge there. Um, your alternates, if you don't want to do that, um, is a cable car. So from Plan Pra, you can get the cable car up or down to La Brevent, um, and then you can continue on your journey. If you want to do a trail that's continuous from Plan Pra, you can drop back down partway into the valley and then come back up at Refuge Bella Chat to get around it. Now, people are hiking this section every day. Um, I'm seeing pictures every other day of people passing through there. There's a there's a track of 
um, footprints being cut in there. Um, but given I'm not sure the range of experiences on this call, if you haven't done snow before, especially if you're going to start in Plan Pro and go straight up there and do that for your first alpine hiking experience, I'd highly not recommend doing that because you're going to one of the more challenging parts. I'd skip it then. If you've done the tour and this is the first time you've been in snow and this is one of your last stages that you're doing and you felt fine on all the other snow that you've done, then I would say that you'd be right to explore it and see um, and, and make those decisions in terms of like, you know, what time of the day is it that you're approaching? Is your energy levels good? Um, if you turn back, can you still get the cable car down? That sort of thing. The next one is Col des Fours. So this is an alternate route on the Tour de Mont Blanc. It's got both steep snow and snow bridges in this area, a number of snow bridges in this area. Um, so the alternate for this is taking the main trail to, that goes via Le Chapeau. And if you're intending to go across Col des Fours to save you some time, with the snow, you don't really save much time because you've got to take it pretty slow. Um, and if you're ascending that area, then you've also, you know, you're losing half a step each time with a bit of slip back in the snow. Um, but if you, you know, if you do take too long going via Le Chapeau, then the bus um, starts running, I think it's this weekend, um, between Val de Glacier and Refuge Montet. So you can always take that too. The next one is between Chalet Valforet and Refugio Elena. So this is the picture that's here. Um, there's There was a pretty um, uh, difficult snow bridge or risky snow bridge, I guess, to cross. Um, and then there's a, underneath it, there's a broken bridge that um, wasn't packed away. Winter was left there and has now been damaged and broken. So at some point, this snow, people should not cross it or won't be able to cross it. Um, the torrent's quite strong at that point. Um, there's an alternate, an easy alternate. So you can take a, a track that's below this trail that goes up to Elena and it might add five to 10 minutes of hiking. So an easy way around this. Um, dare I say this bridge will be repaired. Elena is only opening this weekend and usually the Alpine clubs in the area will either address it themselves or report it and have it fixed up um, given it's such a high traffic trail as well. So I don't think this will be for the whole season, but it is for right now. The next one is Fenetri Arpet which is the alternate route on the Tour de Mont Blanc. Um, so you've got a post holing risk over a big boulder field down the bottom. So, so this trail, this alternate is a difficult trail anyway. It's very steep, very rocky and rugged. Um, and, and specifically there's snow at the moment over the, the boulder field. And we're talking like people sized boulders. These things are huge. You've got to kind of leap and scramble over them anyway. Um, so with snow over them, it is quite treacherous um, if the snow's soft and, and there's post holing happening in that area. And then at the very top, you've got, um, there is some steep snow still, but people have started to look at it, do it, um, and they're scrambling around it. But that also has its own set of challenges when you're off trail and scrambling. So um, it's it's not recommended to do this route at the moment by the Le Chamonet, the, the rescue service. It's 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 too early and, and only really someone who, really understood what it was like in these sort of alpine trails, challenging alpine trails with snow, would would or should be considering something like that. Anyone who wants to have a hiking experience, don't do this route right now. Um, so the main trail on the Tour de Mont Blanc is the one to take that avoid this one. Walker's Hout route hotspots. All right, so Fenetri up at is the first one that's on the classic route of the Walker's Hout route, so I won't touch on that again, but you'll need to go via um, Alp Bovine. Uh, Sentier de Chamois Trail. So this is a trail from the Verbier ski area around on the balcony to Cabin de Luby. So you get this great view out over the Combine Massive and Val de Bain. Um, so you've got some deep snow on this part and you've also that picture that I showed earlier, um, snow melt, there's potential for snow melt triggered rock fall there as well. Um, people have started to pass it. There is an option to come up halfway along that balcony trail to reach Col Terman. That would be the way I'd recommend 
doing. So from the Verbieski area, you drop down a little bit and then you come along, you come up about halfway and then come on to Cold Terman. That's the one I'd consider if you wanted to, to tackle this. But the people who have done it so far have used spikes and an ice axe to do it confidently, um, as reported by Kevin Deluvi. If you don't want to do that, don't need to. Um, you can get transport to, uh, you can get a bus from Le Chablais to Fine in the valley and then come up on this beautiful trail through the nature reserve, which often has Ibex sightings um, to arrive at Cabin de Luby. And then from there, you can make your assessment of whether you um, consider the Grand Desert, which is the next one I'll talk about. But this one, um, this one has a, a post holing risk. It's a high up on plateau. I mentioned before, it's a, it's a long stretch um, with varied terrain, very rocky terrain, and and it has a yeah a post selling risk for a very long, a very long and exhausting time. What I've known on previous years is the first few people that try it usually don't make it. They usually turn back because it is so incredibly energy sapping to break the trail in that area, and people usually probe it early, like earlier than what um, Cabin de Louvre or Cabin de Mott Fort would recommend um, trying it. Um, you've also got some really steep snow in there. So when you come off Col de Luvi at the beginning, you've got a steep run down and then about uh, just over probably about two thirds along, you've also got this steep ridge that you need to descend down. And then on the Plefleury, the Col Plefleury side, on the cabin side, so when you've crossed the Grand Desert and you're like, Ooh, I'm getting out of it, you've got like a 45 degree slope, which when I was there last week, I saw still had snow on it as well. So there's multiple challenges on that area. and if you're not confident in high alpine early season um, hiking, mountaineering, that kind of blend, then I would avoid it as well. Don't be don't be the one to to cross it first. Let someone local or someone else to to do it. Um, and the good thing is you can you can get around it with transport. So from Cabin de Luvi, you're down to Fine, the Chablais, round to Martigny on the train, so you're on, and then you're back in to either. Um, Grand Dixus or to a roller on the bus set. The next one's Val de D. So then this one is a classic route um, for the Hout route as well. You've got post holing over the glacial moraine, the Chilean glacier that comes out there. So the big moraine that's receded back over many years. Um, really rocky terrain. This photo here, this is of that looking towards Lac de D. So this was taken uh, yeah, a week ago. When I was up there, um, so you got snow over that, so post holing onto rocks, um, and then you've also got snow melt, snow melt triggered rockfall on that face that you ascend. So right there, where I've got the arrow, that's where you're ascending <laughs> up in there, and I can still see snow around that on the higher sections, and it's normally quite active um, at that point. Um, so your alternates here is transport from Grand Dixis. The bus has started running for the season, so you can get back down um, to see on and then back up to a roller um, and then if you do that you can come up from a roller and have a look um, at Pastor Chev it's still a good hike up there and down it's a beautiful valley actually you come into you can even see the Matterhorn from Pastor Chev on a clear day um, and there's glaciers all on, on the Pennine Alps side on the on the chain there so worth yeah still still worth going to have a look um, and it was mostly clear of snow a week ago too so you'd be fine to do it uh, or you can do the alternate route over Col de la Miana. So this one from Grand Dixis goes sort of lower down the valley towards Sion. Um, it still had some snow on it from what I could see, but it was quite patchy. And um, that you'd be fine, you'd be fine to cross and go that way if you wanted to hike. You'd end in Eveline on the other side, and then from there you could come up on the bus to Rolla or the Hesdries, wherever you had your accommodation at that point you want to stay on that continuous hiking journey. All right, the last two then. So Walker's Hout route, we've got the, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay, I'll look at that in a second. So Cabin de Moray. So this is this is a steep snow section and I watched this guy coming down <laughs> and he just had one pole and uh, no spikes on his feet and I was fearful for him <laughs> as he was coming but um the challenge is is steep snow in this sort of neck that you come to um on the ascent it's it's quite steep normally you're supported by a chain or rope in this part um but it's all under snow at the moment um 
And so I was fine ascending with micro spikes and my poles. And as I said, I, I did use my ice axe coming down, but I didn't think it was really warranted. I was getting a fine footprint in as I was going and I would have had, I definitely had my spikes on though. Um, but this is a good illustration of like different people's approach and assessment, right? So I could tell you it's a good idea to use micro spikes and you'll go there and you'll see a bunch of people who are not using them and confidently going up and down. Like it's kind of one of those things that is everyone's race and how everyone, you know, is going to feel the most confident in their step. Um, I certainly carry my micro spikes around everywhere and that. So it's just a risk to be aware of. There's This trail is frequented given that it's a popular uh, location for people to go to then summit the peaks behind Moray. Um, so when I was coming up there last Sunday, there was, I reckon there was 90 to 100 people coming down over that afternoon as I was ascending, they were all coming down, huge number. So it's certainly possible to get there. That's that's kind of the message, but just I'm just pointing out that there's a steep snow challenge there. That if it worries you, then the only alternative is that you need to skip um, that section and, and stay at uh, Barrage de Moray or down to Grimmins. Um, the last one then is on the Europa Vic Trail. So between Herbrigan and Europa Hut, so this on the classic route. So just a couple of days um, when I was up there, it's it's like, you know, 100 metres from the top, you can like see the balcony that you're nearly there and there's this one last bridge that you need to cross and <laughs> a bridge had been swept had broken off on one side and had been swept um, and was not in place. So this, um, I sat there for 20 minutes looking at different options and, and thinking about probing even whether I could get across, but the torrent was just too strong there. And I, um, yeah, I decided not to, I couldn't, I couldn't do it safely. So I came back down and then I told the tourism officers yesterday and they weren't aware of that damage. So they've sent someone, they're sending someone up to assess it and determine so they're, it's likely I, I don't know if it's a quick fix i don't know if they can get a chopper or how they did spin it back around it looked like some of the cables were still there so maybe it's quick maybe it's not but in the meantime until you know that it's open and good to go it'd be continuing along the valley from herbrig into randa and then ascending at randa to europa hut or the suspension bridge and continuing on to tash help or or um, vice versa going to Europa Hut and then coming down at Randa. Um, yeah, that's that's the only option. Because otherwise you've got a thousand metre climb from the valley from Herbrigan up there and then you need to come back down, come up to Randa, which is another couple of hundred metres climb, and then you've got another 800 metres climb. So you, it's, a lot, it's a lot to be turned around at the top and keep going. Um, other trail changes due to rockfall, just to call out. So the trails close between Grand Dixis and Val de Dee. So if you're planning to stay Grand Dixis and then go into Val de Dee in the next week, just the next week, there's been a rockfall there just before you hit the tunnels. And so they're working to secure the wall and the rock. You can walk around the rock, but the wall's what they're worried about. So they're trying to bolt that down and net it at the moment. So that'll be one more week that you won't be able to pass that way. So if you can't, if you skip around the Grand Desert from Luvi and stay at um, either Bluffluri or or the Grand Dixis, then you you can't go Grand Dixis. You need to go Bluffluri over Coldella Rocks and then on that way. Um, otherwise, yeah, come back out on the bus. The last one then is the direct bus between the parking lot below the Moray Glacier and Zanal is not running this season because a direct road between Grimmins and Zanal have a rockfall issue as well. So it's not just a rockfall to clear, it's something that they need to secure on the wall. So they said that they don't think they're going to open it this summer and they've taken it off their timetables now. So your options are either get some more connecting buses from Grimmins to Visoy and around, or you can, um, when you get to Grimmins, you can go up on the cable car to the ski area and then jump on the gondola and go all the way down to Zanar, which would, you know, show you the trail that you're missing there. Um, uh, or get a taxi from the parking lot there below the Moray Glacier, which the tourism office said would be 80 francs to do, to Zanar. Tour of Monterosa hotspot. So if you've been following what I've been up to, I've not had time to get on to any of Monterosa yet, but I hope to in the in the next uh, in the next few couple of weeks. 
Um, but the Tour of Monterosa has an association which is quite active. If you're doing it this trail, you've probably seen um, you've probably seen their web page, and they will put an indication on whether the, when the passes are possible to do. Um, so they've got you know provide hut providers and service providers along the whole trail in this association, and they um, they keep their their simple web page up updated. Um, so I think it's this weekend because um, this is when they were planning to open the whole of Europa with eggs. So I'm expecting in the next day or two, we're gonna see a little latest news update. Last year, it was on the 24th of June. So we should see it come up um, and that should all change. That little gift there, that's the bridge. So it's the same situation on the Tour of Monte Rossa, that part of the Europa Vig trail, it's on the Hout route and the Monte Rossa. So you can see it there sort of swept into the middle. Um, and so they're impacted too. So yeah, that website, the one to check out. So, on a more upbeat note, <laughs> the Alps are certainly waiting for you. Uh, you know, most of the trails are snow free. Uh, like, like I said earlier on the call, like even when I'm up towards 2,900 meters at the moment, it's patchy. Like, and the trails usually do a pretty damn good job at avoiding the snow. They run along the south facing side of these sort of valleys that come up to the passes, and and um, yeah, you're just scratching, you're just crossing small spit, small bits. Um, there's an excellent transport network that can help you detour around anything that you're not comfortable comfortable with, confident with. Um, the valleys, you know, are alive with wildflowers at the moment. Uh, and by this weekend, you know, you've got all the huts open um, and they'll be ready to welcome you. Like, you know, early season hiking when they're just kicking off again, the service level is very high. When you get to September, <laughs> they're approaching close time and they've answered the same question you know every day for the whole season they're they're not as uh, hospitable i'd say <laughs> but who could blame you um and then you know the, the rich green pastures of sort of the early part of the season and the white snow cap mountains like create this unreal contrast in the landscape um early in the summer too so you know that awaits you as well so yeah if you're hiking in the next week or two you know you're worried about the snow yeah you've got to be conscious about what's there but you can absolutely have an incredible journey and just going to it the right approach knowing that there's options for you all the time um along the way um yeah and you'll have a you'll have a great experience and a, and a great journey um all right so we're at 10 minutes left and i'm uh, I've got a couple of questions here, and then I'm going to see if I can pop up the um, the questions that have come in throughout. So, uh, what time do the afternoon rain showers begin? So they're typically forecast from 3 p.m. when when it is sort of stormy. Um, yesterday was four when when a bad storm blew in. The day before it was forecast for three, and and nothing came until 6:30. So it, yeah, forecast for three, but it it varies for sure. Um, Will the middle third of the Hout route be safe to navigate on the 1st of July? Yeah, I, I, I can't answer that, unfortunately. So given Cabin de Montfort is out this season, they're closed this season, Cabin de Luvi becomes a focal point for people who are um, thinking of going, thinking of like testing that route, doing that route. Um, I, would, I would say sometime in that first week of July, people will will probe it um whether you, whether you want to be the person to do it it just depends on your experience hopefully i've kind of explained the challenge of it it'll be bloody hard work and there's also some risk involved in in doing that too um being the first in there too so yeah don't know unfortunately but um go to luvi certainly go to luvi it's a great part of the the hout route experience and there'll be others there doing the hout route asking the exact same question and you can either all share a transfer around together, which is probably cheaper than an individual public transport thing in Switzerland, um, or, or maybe you attempt it if you've got the right experience and um, skill and abilities. Um, would micro spikes be recommended by the 1st of July? So I, I would say if you're closely monitoring where the freezing line is and you're confident that it's not, you know, it's hard because your journey is right, two weeks, right? 10 days, two weeks. So 
you're looking you're only looking at three to six days out for a, a stable forecast so even though i'm seeing you know freezing level up really high for the next six days you you might start your journey in five days and then you've got 10 days after that so my inclination is always to have them because you do even get snow days on the high parts of the trail in july and august and september so it over your journey it might change and then it might be on that night that you're at moray and i know this is all sort of mites maybes but you know part of it is in your toolkit having things that can help you progress the journey in a safe way so you know 400 grams or a pound or whatever um i think it's worth it until you know that the snow's gone from at least moray um and then ideally the other part some of the other passes as well um on the trail so you're probably more looking like mid-july the time when you're starting to ask that question seriously for the hout route um okay let me see if i can get the questions oh, oh no sorry this one all right how about mount Fafspur? so mount Fafspur it does have a steep um section of snow on it as you come off it on the Cormoyer side um i didn't call it out as one of the i was one of the hot spots but it would probably be the next one that i would add to that list um it i saw a picture of it from a few days ago it's got a really good trampled down um track in it but that can also make the snow quite icy because it's so compressed down um so yeah it's a challenge and then the alternate route there would be at either um cabin combo junction or at refugio mason villa you can drop down and do this valley trail and and connect um with it there so you can avoid mount five spur um if you didn't like the the sound of it or look of it just saw a post where someone said that said the washed out bridge on tmb from valforet to la Foley has a new bridge in place oh perfect okay so that that's probably the one that i've just shown you so yeah i think with cabin with refugio elena opening they probably look to address that straight away that's good news i'll update my material thank you um okay so going from lehesdries to grubin next friday so i didn't have any trouble with col to sart um and then from there you've you've got yeah more asoribus and then for Cleta, i i didn't have any trouble on on those sections it's it's not got any of the the more serious risks that val de and and the grand desert do so i think that's fine um to consider experience fit group experience hiking in the alps yeah and nepal yeah okay so you you'll know you'll know the kind of thing that you're coming into so i think that's good uh to rosa is there campsites in most villages and valleys yeah okay so there is you can do the monte rossa with camping and there's a couple of bivouac like little huts there's like six to eight people that you can um you can sleep into they do have strict rules on their wild camping it's like over two and a half thousand meters which puts you in pretty inhospitable terrain typically um but yes you can you can do it with campsites and and the bivouacs as well uh the monsox variant yeah i saw some pictures from that yesterday someone's done that and and had no trouble up there a lot of it's just patchy up on top now uh tmb on thursday that's yeah awesome uh will we give more updates yes yes we have got four trail ambassadors on the tmb at the moment feeding us in updates and then others are just sending them in um so yeah we'll keep pushing them out daily recommend micro spikes tmb early july so i think micro spikes if you haven't crossed snow before and you haven't done like alpine hiking in snow before so you don't know what that will be and and you're not sure about you know you're not confident with your balance or your footing or how you're going to go bring them just bring them just have them with you um if you are you know nimble and you know have great balance and you know confident in, in how you're going to travel you know ideally you've done a little bit in the alpine but not necessarily so you don't have to have done things in snow it's just if you're a fit person that 
that has great balance and things, then then you could consider not using micro spikes unless you want to do that cold des fours route, or you know be be confident on doing um, the prevent side as well, prevent prevent section as well. Then and say yeah, have it. So um, we have day one plan. Some on fourth, then colder sharks under cabin the flurry. Yeah, and so end of July, Scott's question there. Absolutely have that day, that day. That for end of July, it'll be a different story up there. It's still be still still challenging part of the trail, but it's um uh yeah, it's not gonna be like what I've been showing and what we've been talking about now. I think that's all the questions. Let me go back. Yeah, nice. Mount Faf Spur. <laughs> Another question there. there. There's also, yeah, there's also a, um, a like a snow melt charged runoff there too, which um, the people are taking off their boots and crossing that I'm seeing there as well. Um, saying TMR is about second. Do you have an update to? Yeah, I've put, I've put the update into our map for the route to go via Randa, if you're interested in our map, that uh, yep, yep, and, and and it'll be in there as an alternate route until um, such time that we know that that bridge is going to be put back in place. So you'll still have you'll still have the original. I'll still have the original in all my maps because I'm not going to know. You know, it could be the day that you arrive that they reopen it, and you don't want to have a dependency on getting another map thing from me. You want to have it with you, but. Um, yeah, primary way via render until it that's the case. Yeah, welcome, man. Okay, awesome. One minute to go. If any other question pops in, I'll quickly answer it. Otherwise, we will call it there. Thanks for your time. Enjoy your adventure. Oh, and Sian, uh, Sian, sorry, just asked when the next update would be. So we'll we'll continue to update on our channels. We haven't got another call organised, but we'll um we'll think about doing one in in the next ten days or so. Um, but yeah, otherwise we'll we'll keep pushing out updates daily. Oh, Swiss topo. Oh, I saw one more question pop up. Maybe I can answer. Swiss topo. Uh, yeah. So the route is relatively new from Herbrig into Europa Hut. It's well marked when you're there. Um, so get yourself to Europa Hut. <laughs> you, can, you can find your way up there. Um, I'm sure they're going to add it soon. They're pretty good at sending their people out to to capture new trail data. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, I'll wrap it up then. See you, everyone. See you in the Alps soon. Take care. Bye.